please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, Bernard. Thank you for joining us again this morning in our CAT conference. Uh, I'm sure some of you will, want, will watch this again later. It's a real honor to have Bernard Prendergast, who's a great friend um, from St. Thomas's and now Cleveland Clinic London, uh, talk to us about the new guideline update in Europe. And Bernard is, a, is a really, truly an expert and world-renowned in interventional cardiology and structural heart and has been involved in many of these sort of guideline documents. So Bernard, um, looking forward, like I said before, to see you in person in a couple of weeks, but uh, thank you for making the time. So thanks, Azim. It's such a pleasure to, be, to see you and speak to you and also to join you and your team at Monty. It's such a shame also that I can't be with you in the Bronx and be talking to you as, as a group in person. I was making some attempts to go to TCT uh, next week and uh, in his wisdom, President Biden has banned me from traveling. So we live and work in very strange times and the sooner that we can all come together and be a community face to face, the better it will be for all of us. We agree. So I'm going to speak to you for about uh, 20 or 25 minutes about the European guidelines. Obviously, there are very many similarities and areas of overlap with uh, guidelines and practice in the US. But on the other hand, there are some differences as well. And I hope there will be time to explore and discuss some of those in the same uh, sitting. So this is the uh, composition of the guideline committee. I, I don't want you to read the, the long series of names here, but I just use this as a slide to emphasize that this is a large group, a large task force, as they call it in Europe, composed of uh, interventional cardiologists, imaging or diagnostic cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, general clinical cardiologists, and also for the first time, clinical trial specialists uh, embodied by Nick Fremantle from the UK and Peter Uni from Canada, who was specifically commissioned by the ESC to provide more rigor in terms of the appraisal of the levels of evidence and the quality of the randomized control trials in spe specifically in relation to valve disease, but also in relation to the guidelines movement uh, more widely. And in terms of valve disease, I want to remind you that uh, valve disease is a dangerous condition and one that we need to take seriously. And this is a case vignette from uh, London in the period of COVID. An 84 year old man who was well known to uh, the valve service and had been monitored for progression of his aortic stenosis for some while, who developed symptomatic deterioration in April 2020 in the midst of the COVID pandemic. And partly in relation to the chaos of that time, the uh, onward referral letter was lost in the system and we didn't hear anything from the patient until late last year when he made contact with the service to tell us that his symptoms were worse and he was wondering what was happening. And you've probably read the rest of the slide by now to illustrate that despite our efforts to catch up with this man's progress, uh, the simultaneous restrictions on our activity meant that he died uh, very tragically five days before his scheduled TAVI or TAVAR procedure uh, in, in early January of 2021. And a final irony, uh, a coda to this story, is that his wife uh, very tragically had undergone a successful TAVI under our care only two years ago. So you can imagine dealing with the, the grief and the, um, the consequences of this tragic outcome with the family was particularly difficult. And I think all of, uh, we have all had similar scenarios during the period of COVID, but it's a reminder to ourselves and also to our surgical colleagues that valve disease is not a static condition and it requires very active management, not only in terms of the intervention, but also in terms of the pathway that leads to that interventional procedure. And that's because uh, the valves are the, uh, the essential to the uh, normal function of the heart and malfunction of the valves, whether it's stenosis or regurgitation has downstream consequences 
in terms of left ventricular function, secondary valve failure as a result of ventricular overload, the development in aortic stenosis and mitral valve disease of left atrial dilatation, and ultimately pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular dilatation, and significant tricuspid regurgitation. And it's also a sad consequence of COVID that we've seen many patients presenting in this very end stage of heart valve disease in the UK and, and in London, where sometimes our best efforts to treat the underlying primary lesion is unsuccessful in reversing this cycle of uh, complete cardiac decompensation. We've also been able to investigate and interrogate that uh, more intensely using the tool of cardiac magnetic resonance. And this illustrates uh, the perils of the so-called watchful waiting policy, which has been very much part of the traditional practice in heart valve disease for many years, whereby asymptomatic patients are monitored in the outpatient clinic setting. And without particular declaration of symptoms, their left ventricular and subsequently right ventricular function declines significantly, such that by the time they decompensate, we're already too late in the natural history of the disease to reverse these important ultrastructural changes. So a key uh, focus of the European guidelines uh, on this occasion, this is the, I think the fifth iteration of the heart valve disease guidelines in Europe, uh, the latest updates in 2021 being uh, four years on from the previous publication in 2017. But key messages here were to improve generalized awareness of the importance of heart valve disease, to drive the political agenda to allow earlier diagnosis and access to specialists, to endorse the creation of dedicated valve centers that we'll discuss briefly, and also to encourage more physicianly uh, colleagues to co contemplate earlier intervention for their patients and to involve patients actively in that decision. These concepts are summarized in this original illustration from the guidelines document, pointing out the importance of a referral network, the heart valve center sitting at the, uh, the, the hub of this network, and the heart valve clinic nesting within the heart valve center and providing specialist assessment review and a decision making pathway. And I'm not sure how this tallies with US standards, but certainly uh, in the UK and Europe, we now recognize heart valve centers that have 24 hour seven uh, services that have the full gamut of the heart team with interventionists, clinicians, surgeons, imagers, uh, and also the uh, anesthesiologists who support our procedures when needed, but also outright reach into more general uh, cardiological areas, including heart failure, electrophysiology, the involvement of healthcare of the elderly specialists with our older, more frail patients, and the wider expertise within a major hospital that supports you when complications arise. You need a heart team which is appropriately governed and stewarded to ensure that the process is robust and administered appropriately. And you need a good volume of procedures, be they surgical or interventional, to ensure the best clinical outcomes. We all know that multimodality imaging is essential. I've already emphasized the importance of the heart valve clinic. And finally, we need to focus on the issues of data collation and reporting in the public domain and programs of education targeted at the referral network, extending out even to primary care, the family practitioner who may be the first to diagnose the condition. And for many years, we've debated uh, the, the, the pros and the cons of earlier intervention versus watchful waiting and the risks of delay that I've already outlined. And this discussion is relevant in aortic stenosis, but it's equally relevant in mitral regurgitation as well. The guidelines have supported uh, lower thresholds at stronger levels of evidence for intervening in aortic stenosis in the absence of symptoms, 
whether that's determined by uh, the onset of very early left ventricular impairment assessed by echo, whether it's related to uh, demonstrable symptoms during exercise testing, or whether we are using other tools such as uh, serum biomarkers, including BNP or troponin, which will indicate uh, the onset of left ventricular dilatation and impairment. We also have some early randomized control trial data from uh, Korea, published in the New England Journal just over two years ago, suggesting that an early surgical approach in appropriate surgical candidates with aortic stenosis compared with conservative watchful waiting is associated with improved outcomes, not only at one or four year follow-up, but now extending out to eight years, demonstrating that the earlier intervention approach uh, bears clinical fruit and benefits for the patient. So that has meant that we can extend our, our range of intervention to earlier uh, phases of deterioration and as I've already uh, suggested, this can be determined by echocardiographic characteristics highlighted here, also by means of severe valve calcification on, on uh, cardiac CT or the serum biomarkers that I've already mentioned. We can extend the paradigm beyond aortic stenosis also to aortic regurgitation, where left ventricular dilatation is the natural pathophysiology. And we have stronger, more robust guidelines in Europe now to support those recommendations. And we can also extend the principles to mitral valve disease demonstrated here uh, relating to primary mitral regurgitation, where a more aggressive stance with a, a smaller left ventricular end, uh, end systolic diameter of 40 millimeters is now the threshold to consider uh, preemptive surgery in the absence of symptoms, especially and particularly when valve repair uh, is available in the hands of an experienced mitral valve repair surgeon. Even, albeit at a lower left strength of evidence, we can also make recommendations regarding intervention for severe tricuspid regurgitation in the absence of symptoms recognizing again that these patients do badly over long-term follow-up if the valve lesion isn't corrected early. Now focusing a little bit more on intervention and specifically intervention for aortic stenosis, uh, this area was tackled uh, very robustly by the task force and I don't mind telling you that many hours of debate and uh, intellectual discussion were held regarding the thresholds to determine suitability for surgery or transcatheter aortic valve intervention for severe aortic stenosis. The first important thing to remember is that both treatments are very good for patients and using uh, surgery and transcatheter options as complementary uh, modalities has resulted in a massive increase in the number of patients with aortic stenosis undergoing some form of treatment in the last seven to 10 years. And these are the STS TVT registry data uh, that were published by John Carroll uh, just over one year ago, demonstrating the rise of TAVI, the relatively small impact on overall numbers of surgical patients, but most importantly of all, a massive increase in the number of patients receiving some form of treatment. And of course, this development of TAVI uh, didn't happen by accident. It happened as a result of a uh, continuation of uh, pivotal randomized control trials in high intermediate and then low risk patients, randomized to either surgery or TAVI, and then followed up at 30 days, one year, and demonstrated here five years, with very favorable results for the transcatheter option, particularly when it could be performed via transfemoral approach. And the important gap in our evidence base was provided by the Partner 3 and the Evolute Low Risk Trials published in 2019. And the availability of two year follow up data uh, presented in abstract form 18 months ago and published one year ago in JAK, demonstrating that the, for the primary endpoint of death, 
heart failure or need for rehospitalization. In fact, Tavar was the winner in comparison with surgery at the two year time point. Now, importantly, when we focus on these trials, it's important that we understand the background to them and the uh, limitations of the, of the randomized control trial. And you can imagine that our statistical experts and methodologists were very keen to point these out within the guidelines document. The low risk aortic stenosis trials only enrolled those with high flow aortic stenosis who were suitable for a transfemoral procedure with a mean age of 73 years and 60% uh, of the population below the age of, six, of 75. Conversely, patients with low flow aortic stenosis, a bicuspid valve, multiple valve disease, concomitant significant coronary disease, or high risk anatomy for either procedure were excluded. And those of you who are engaged in the uh, TAVI program at Monty will know that a huge proportion of our patients sit in the uh, excluded category from these trials. So we cannot necessarily extrapolate the results of the randomized data sets to our everyday clinical practice is an important message. We also need to listen to the surgeons when they point out that durability isn't really uh, usefully measured until you have data out to 10 years and beyond. And although we have good RCT data at five years and good observational data at eight and nine years, we haven't yet really reached the 10 year landmark and beyond in meaningful numbers, particularly in younger patients. And this is of importance because whilst a five year, six year durability may be acceptable in an 80 year old patient, it certainly won't be a straightforward undertaking in a patient age 60 who may be anticipating two or even three aortic valve intervention procedures in their lifetime. We also need to acknowledge the limited data set for bicuspid valve anatomy and the absence of randomized data. We need to accept that there is room for improvement in terms of the management of conduction disturbances and the high incidence of pacemaker requirement after TAVI. We need to understand that uh, concomitant coronary artery disease is a reality in patients with aortic stenosis. And whilst we have the activation trial to provide some information regarding how to manage these patients, this is a fairly restricted data set and wider research is required. And finally, we have the concern regarding future coronary access in relation to current uh, generation TAVI devices, particularly those that are self-expanding and which uh, effectively uh, conceal the coronary ostia and make access to the coronary ostia difficult for both coronary angiography and PCI particularly in less experienced hands. So with these considerations in mind, the, uh, the European guidelines were relatively conservative in comparison with those in the US. Age was an important distinct distinguishing point. And based upon the randomized data, it was concluded that for patients who are aged less than 75 years, and at low risk for uh, surgery, then surgery was the preferred treatment option recommended by the guideline task force. Conversely, for patients of 75 years or older, particularly those who are unsuitable or high risk for surgery, then there was a clear indication for TAVI. And any patients who do not satisfy these very rigorous criteria should be considered for either mode of treatment, according to heart team assessment and discussion. And this discussion should be guided by numerous factors, including age and surgical risk, the presence of previous bypass grafts, frailty, or active or suspected endocarditis. Acknowledging the fact that transfemoral approach for TAVI is associated with vastly improved outcomes, the suitability for a transfemoral approach strongly favours TAVI. 
Whereas if transfemoral access is not possible, then a serious consideration of surgery is the preferred treatment rather than alternative high-risk TAVI approaches may well be in the patient's interest. Patients with previous chest radiation, porcelain aorta, high risk of patient prosthesis mismatch or chest deformation are best served by TAVI, whereas those with large aortic annually, a bicuspid valve, high risk of coronary obstruction or thrombus in the aorta or left ventricle arguably fare better with surgery. And finally, it's clear that if the patient requires cardiac surgery for other reasons, then clearly the aortic valve intervention should be surgical in the absence of any major contraindications. The guideline task force also recognise that this is a very rapidly moving field. And whilst the normal cycle of uh, update for the guidelines is every four or five years, it was acknowledged that an interim reappraisal of the TAVI SAVAR evidence base would be appropriate in two or three years to take stock of the uh, current state of the art and redefine these recommendations if appropriate. Just very quickly to mention uh, the issue of anticoagulation after a TAVI procedure, we now have a number of uh, uh, randomized control trials at our disposal. This slide summarizes the popular TAVI cohort B. There's a similar slide here for TAVI cohort A in popular. And here is a summary slide outlining the results of Galileo. And the consistent message from these trials was that patients undergoing TAVI are at significant risk of bleeding complications with aggressive antithrombotic re regimens, whether they are dual antiplatelet therapy mediated or anti single antiplatelet therapy in conjunction with a NOAC. And the bottom line conclusion based upon uh, these trials is that oral anticoagulation should be considered lifelong for TAVI patients who have other indications for anticoagulation, most usually atrial fibrillation. But in all other patients, lifelong single antiplatelet therapy, conventionally with aspirin, 75 to 100 milligrams once a day, is the level one recommendation after TAVI. And certainly, routine use of oral anticoagulants, whether they are NOAX or warfarin, is actually harmful to patients after TAVI in the absence of any other indication for an anticoagulation strategy. Moving on now to mitral valve disease and specifically mitral regurgitation, you're all aware that uh, the pathophysiology of mitral regurgitation is variable according to whether or not the valve or the ventricle is the primary pathophysiological entity. And the outcomes of mitral regurgitation in the context of left ventricular disease, so-called secondary mitral regurgitation, are clearly worse than those in patients with primary valve or leaflet disease, as demonstrated by these Kaplan-Meier curves. Worryingly, several uh, contemporary surveys have demonstrated that the uptake of intervention, whether it's surgical or transcatheter in mitral regurgitation, both in the US and in Europe, is extremely low, with the predominant mode of treatment related to medical treatment and relatively little access to surgery or transcatheter alternatives. And this is a major focus of the awareness uh, strategy within the European guidelines. Here is the flow chart for primary mitral regurgitation. I won't walk you through this because it's complicated and may take a little time, but effectively it's very similar to that in the US, emphasizing that the assessment of ventricular function, the presence or absence of atrial fibrillation or pulmonary hypertension are fundamental, and that there should be a low threshold for intervention even in the absence of symptoms when mitral regurgitation is severe and a durable repair by a surgeon is likely. It's also fair based upon the Everest data to say that if the patient is unsuitable for surgery, but anatomically suitable for edge to edge repair, then a transcatheter alternative 
is a very good treatment recommendation. We should also remember the importance of the tricuspid valve, particularly when we're giving a lecture in the company of Azim Latib. But our surgeons need reminding as well that the tricuspid valve is very important in the context of mitral valve disease, and there should be a low threshold for surgical intervention to the tricuspid annulus if there is dilatation in the context of primary mitral valve surgery. Turning now to secondary mitral regurgitation, you will be aware of the controversial uh, discussions regarding the varying results of the two pivotal randomized control trials in Europe, the Mitral of France study, and US, the COAT study. You can see here the very varying results of these two randomized control trials, and a considerable amount of intellectual energy has gone into explaining these uh, uh, paradoxically different outcomes of two superficially very similar trials. The detailed analysis would suggest that the trials were not so similar as it was originally envisaged, however, in that those enrolled into the COAP trial had more significant mitral regurgitation and less significant um, left ventricular impairment compared with those in the European study. Arguably, the uh, levels of technical excellence in the, in the COAP trial were better than those in uh, Europe. And these uh, observations go some way towards explaining the different outcomes of the trials. Importantly, however, the guideline committee were able to amalgamate the results of both and take an overview of the, uh, the, the wider field and whilst emphasizing the importance of a multidisciplinary approach, which is clearly essential in relation to heart specialists, interventional cardiologists, but also supported by EP specialists in relation to the evidence base for uh, cardiac resynchronization in patients with QRS prolongation or left bundle branch block, we're able to recommend that firstly, uh, the initiation of guideline directed medical therapy, including CRT if indicated, was essential. But if the patient remained symptomatic despite these uh, evidence based recommendations, then there was a very strong level of support for intervention by means of surgery or transcatheter edge to edge repair. Indeed, uh, these recommendations were supported here at level, it's slightly hidden by my, I'm just going to move the panel here, just so I'm clear. So this is at the level of evidence 2AB uh, in, in the, uh, Europe, supporting uh, mitral edge to edge repair using the mitra clip, or more recently the Pascal device. And even in patients, uh, selected patients who do not quite fulfill the COAP trial criteria, there is still a level of evidence 2BC supporting transcatheter approaches to this patient population. Finally, I want to make a few words in relation to stroke prevention. Some very important new data will have been presented in the surgical domain recently that I want to share with you. Stroke is a frequent complicator of valvular heart disease and as we all know, is a major source of uh, disability and also fear for our patients. So firstly, to clarify the collation of a number of um, randomized control trial databases, examining the role of NOACs in the context of so-called valvular atrial fibrillation. And in this collection of four randomized control trials over the last 10 years or so, there was a very clear uh, signal supporting the use of these agents with a favorable uh, hazard ratio in relation to the endpoint of stroke. And pulling these together, we can recommend that NOACs are a very suitable alternative to uh, vitamin K antagonists, notably warfarin, for patients with valvular heart disease uh, in the form of aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, and mitral regurgitation. Conversely, we are not yet confident enough to recommend NOACs for 
patients at higher risk of thromboembolism, namely those with significant aortic stenosis, and importantly, those with mechanical heart valves. And this recommendation on this slide does not extend to those high risk patient groups. And finally, I want to share with you the outcome of the LAOS 3 trial that were presented earlier in the year and the subject of intense focus at the EHCTS meeting in Barcelona just two weeks ago, demonstrating that surgical left atrial appendage occlusion at the time of valve surgery was associated with a significant reduction in the risk of stroke over long term follow up. And it would appear that for the expenditure of an extra six minutes of surgical time in the OR, the time in which is required to occlude the left atrial appendage at the time of other concomitant cardiac surgery, is a very small price to pay for the prevention of stroke in the short, medium and, and long term follow up of our patients with heart valve disease. And this was therefore supported by the guidelines committee to level of evidence 2AB. The reason it's not 1A is because at the moment there is only one randomized controlled trial. And the ESC rules regarding the level of evidence are that you need two randomized controlled trials with a consistent message to support a level one recommendation. So I shall close my uh, talk here with some final comments relating to guidelines and their application in everyday clinical practice. It's important to remember that these are guidelines only. It's recognized that these guidelines uh, do not always apply easily to our patients who present with combinations of disease and comorbidities that make application of the guidelines difficult and sometimes impossible. And the ESC is very clear, and I believe the ACCAHA as well, in emphasizing that these guidelines do not override or supplant the judgment of healthcare professionals who are making the right decisions for their patients. As Catherine Otto put it recently in an accompanying editorial, guidelines are not the Bible. And it's important that we use guidelines in the way that they're intended to guide our practice and to inform our conversations with colleagues in the heart team setting to make the right decision for our patients. Thanks very much for listening. Bernard, that was as usual in typical Bernard style phenomenal and very clear and succinct. So thank you so much. Um, I've asked some of the fellows and, and uh, attendings to join our conversation because I'm sure Many of them have questions uh, that they want to ask you. I did have one before they start. So the guideline for the, the 2A indication for transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair in secondary mitral regurgitation, okay? So there's a 2A indication saying that if patients are good co-op candidates, but they're also not, they're not good surgical candidates, that tier is, uh, should be considered, and it's a 2A indication. Correct. That almost contradicts the fact that in the next line, it says that surgery is a 2B indication, though. So I, if I remember correctly, the 2B is more in relation to uh, the presence or absence of coexistence coronary disease. Okay. Now, you know that we, the STITCH trial has tried to address the whole issue of uh, coronary revascularization in the context of LV failure and mitral regurge. Mm -hmm. An interpretation of that trial is also complicated. I think it's fair to say that the surgeons argued very strongly in, in this area. Uh, and uh, they was, you know, there was some support for their argument. And that's why right. I got into 2B. Okay. Uh, but... Equally, it was important to emphasize that TIA has an important place at the table, which wasn't necessarily an easy win, given that the European trial was essentially neutral in right. relation to transcatheter treatment. Right. No, absolutely. I mean, I think what's been a big change for us in the US uh, is the fact, especially with reimbursement, 
that for tear in secondary MR, you no longer need uh, surgery to say that the patient is not a surgical candidate or high risk. It requires yeah. heart failure actually to say that the patient's on optimal medical therapy, which I think is a is a more appropriate actual you know gatekeeper for for tear in heart failure. I agree entirely because my my own personal view is that surgery has no role in these patients, and in the UK, you cannot drag a surgeon to treat a patient with with an LVEF of twenty five percent and severe MR. Yeah, they will say it's not a surgical disease. So. I think it's a strong European argument as opposed to a UK argument, certainly. Right. Right. Azim, I'm just moving location a little bit because I'm in a room where some other people want to hold a meeting. So I'm just yeah. moving location. No problem. I'm still we'll, with you. We'll give you a chance. So I'm just going to, I hope you, I, we don't lose connection. Yeah, I'm in another room now. Can you still hear me? We can still hear you and see you. That's great. Perfect. So um, I'm going to pass you on to the fellows for their questions, and then we'll take some questions from the chat. So go ahead. I'm not sure who wants to go first. Um, I'm going to go first. Thank you so much for the great talk and this uh, a great uh, uh, review of guidelines. Uh, I have a question about, uh, obviously, those patients with coronary disease. We see a lot of them, um, you know, uh, in, in this era of aging, a lot of these patients have complex coronary anatomy. And currently, as you mentioned, the guidelines are not providing us with uh, um, enough evidence um, as of now. Uh, in your experience, what are those kind of uh, lesions that you would be concerned proceeding with TABR? Uh, in the setting of obviously those patients with severe AS to fix before TAVR, um, those coronary lesions that you would be concerned for the patient to go for TAVR. So thanks, Samin. That's a really important question. Uh, I'll, I'll wave a flag of publicity for the activation trial that we led from St. Thomas's London. This is a trial that enrolled uh, patients over the last uh from 10 years ago to about five years ago so remember that patients in that era were relatively elderly undergoing TAVI and we uh enrolled patients with either no angina or CCS class one or two and, that, and with significant coronary disease and randomized them to PCI before TAVI or TAVI alone and the outcome of that trial uh a multi-center trial, uh, about 400 patients, was that the patients did not benefit from having a PCI. If anything, they did, they did worse if they underwent an interventional strategy as a result of bleeding secondary to the dual antiplatelet therapy in the wake of stenting. So based upon the only randomized control trial, we can say that if you are elderly and you have relatively mild angina, there is no benefit from having a PCI in addition to a TAVA. You should just have your aortic stenosis fixed and stay on a single antiplatelet agent. Now, of course, it's more complicated than that because coronary disease comes in different shapes and forms. And certainly if you have a, a significant left main lesion or an osteo right coronary lesion that may be jeopardized by the TAVI implant, then we would treat those lesions in advance of a TAVI. We would also treat the coronary disease uh, more aggressively if angina is the dominant symptom, as opposed to breathlessness or syncope, for example. So that's our algorithm in London. Colleagues in Europe have taken a far more liberal approach, perhaps relation to fee-for-service, and are happy to put a stent in any lesion even in a branching second marginal uh, before, uh, before the TAVA procedure. But I think we need to seriously appraise our practice and, and work out what's the driving hemodynamic lesion for the patient and treat that as our primary strategy. Thank you. Thanks, Bernard. Nikos? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that was a great review of uh, the guidelines. 
um, uh, I feel that there is a gap, and uh, you pointed out in your uh, first slides, uh, with who is the patient that we're going to intervene early, and probably who is going to who is the patient who's going to respond the most, and he's going to have the most of the benefit. And I feel that um, our conventional markers that we have so far with echocardiography and maybe CT, or they they are kind of lacking of uh, evidence. Uh, and we're kind of exhausting the tools that we already have uh, to, to predict and figure out who is going to do better. Um, what, is your, your, what are your thoughts about uh, the design of trial that would kind of combine biology with the clinical data in a prospective manner? Either this is going to be like a plasma or serum biomarkers or even more access to myocardial tissue to be able to predict who is going to be uh, benefiting the most. And are there any efforts that are being done towards this uh, um, direction? Okay, so super important question, Nikos, thank you. So there are studies ongoing and I'm pleased to say they're coming from the UK. So uh, there's a study called the Evolved Trial, which is being led by colleagues in Edinburgh, Professor David Newby and Mark Dweck and their team. And they are using uh, cardiac MRI. In fact, the slide that I showed of that patient developing fibrosis over a one year period was from the Edinburgh group. And they are using the markers of, in aortic stenosis, the markers of left ventricular hypertrophy on the ECG, troponin biomarkers, and cardiac MRI to randomize patients to early surgery versus watchful waiting. And that study is nearly complete, and I think will be a very important uh, element of the answer to your question because I agree with you entirely that uh, routine echocardiography is a very blunt instrument. And we are seeing patients far too late in the, in the natural history of their disease uh, by the time they come to the heart valve center and have access to surgery or transcatheter therapy. So we really need to energize the field with better imaging tools but also with better awareness in the hands of the referring network. That's just as important as the imaging. We need our colleagues to be more proactive. Thank you. Uh, Andrea? Yes, uh, Dr. Pendergast, thank you for your talk. I wanted to ask you a comment on the differences between American and European guidelines. Um, for example, as, as Im said, in uh, secondary mitral regurgitation, we in, in Europe, we still had, have to um, uh, let the cardiac surgeon refuse the patients. Um, on the other hand, for uh, aortic valve, for aortic stenosis, also the age is different in uh, the guidelines between American and European. Um, can you comment these two differences? Yeah, so um, in, in relation to mitral valve disease and TIA, I think there was a strong transatlantic bias in relation to the European trial versus the US trial. Um, I think there was also a feeling, not my personal feeling necessarily, but a feeling more broadly that um, the, the French study was investigator led and, and driven through a public health system in France, whereas the COAP trial was industry supported and perhaps um, there were some concerns about that uh, in, in relation to the differing outcomes. So that may well have led to some variation in interpretation and in the strength of, of recommendations in relation to TIA for secondary MR. In aortic stenosis, I think it's fair to say that the, uh, the European guidelines are more cautious and more conservative and take account of fact of the uncertainties regarding the long, the long, long term durability of current TAVI devices. And the surgeons would argue that unless there is strong evidence to change the guideline, then the guideline should remain conservative and unchanged because the threshold of 75 years was there in the 2017 guidelines as well in Europe. There were, there were debates about whether we should lower it to 70 and there, that is already the recommendation in Germany but the guideline committee at large did not feel sufficiently united to lower the age threshold. Now, of course, in the US, you have a different guideline, which is 65 years. 
but that's based upon a slightly different premise, which is the age at which a surgeon would consider us a bioprosthesis compared with a mechanical valve. And the line of logic there is, well, if you're gonna choose a biological valve, why not put it in using a catheter technology instead of open surgery? And I think that's a very logical uh, series of arguments. But the counter argument, particularly from the surgical community in Europe, was that we cannot go as low as 65 or even 70 when the evidence from the randomized control trials was in a cohort with a mean age of 73. So in the end, the compromise, because life is a series of compromises, was that we would stick with 75. In fact, we would make it 75 or greater or 74 or lower if we want to be pedantic. And we would strongly endorse the use of the tables that I illustrated regarding the anatomy and the clinical characteristics of the patient to inform the final decision. And finally, if I may, the one thing that we haven't mentioned completely is the fact that whatever the outcome of the heart team discussion, it should be discussed with the patient. And if the patient says, well, look, I'm 71 or I'm 69, and I hear what you say about durability, but I would like a TAVI, please, then the guidelines do support that because ultimately it's the patient who makes the final decision. Yeah. And I, you know, I also would highlight for everybody listening um, that the European guidelines were endorsed by the, by the European Association of Cardiac Surgery as well, which is very different to the ACC guidelines. The ACC guidelines were, even though there are some surgeons on that guideline committee, it was essentially an American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association guideline. It's not a guideline endorsed by all the surgical communities in the US. I think if you had to try and get the STS and the other surgical associations to endorse the guideline, we would have ended up with a slightly different age limit on the, on the, on the US guideline too. Um, I think appropriately or, or inappropriately, depends how you look at it, surgeons are always going to, until they, we can show longer term durability data on TAVA valves, they, they are going to be conservative as far as the age. So we have a, a few other questions here. Um, let's just, um, from the chat. So just along the lines, we're talking about TAV and we're talking about coronary disease. Mark Manigas, um, one of our attending said, you know, in a patient who has an osteal LAD or left circumflex, so very proximal um, tight lesion, uh, pre tav it's always, and the patient doesn't have angina, it's always difficult. Uh, we'll be participating here in Monty in complete TAVA. I'm not sure if you guys are participating or if it's only a North American study. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, complete TAVA is a 4,000 patient study of after TAVA randomizing patients with coronary disease to full revascularization, complete revascularization or medical therapy. Um, but he says that, you know, even in, in complete TAVA, you know, the use of physiology and its interpretation is difficult in patients with aortic stenosis. So what is your approach to the patient with a very tight proximal osteal LAD who's being evaluated for TAVA in wake of activation? Yeah, so I, I think then we look at the, the, the total clinical picture. So if, the, if it's a patient who's 83, 84 with some renal impairments and, and airways disease, let's say, we would focus on the main goal, which is the aortic valve and do a quick, simple TAVA. And then we can always reassess the patient later and come back another day and treat the, the proximal LAD lesion. Conversely, if it's a younger patient who has more to gain overall from the LAD PCI, and also importantly, a low risk of bleeding complications on DAPT, then we would treat that lesion. So I think you need to tailor it to the individual patient is my, is my take home message. Thanks, Bernard. Um, three more questions and we're gonna let you go. Uh, sorry about that. So uh, Manaf, our structural fellow asks, um, do we need another trial in secondary MR to clarify the discrepancies between MITRE-FR and COAPT? And if so, what 
you know, how would this trial be designed to be, to really kind of clarify the space? So I, I, I'm not a trialologist and it's a super question. Uh, I think there are efforts underway to uh, draw the databases together at patient level to do patient level analyses of the combined Mitral France COAT database. And that will be very important because we need to explore this so-called proportional MR hypothesis in greater detail. Mm -hmm. Because whilst it's an attractive hypothesis, it's never been assessed prospectively. It's an ad hoc retrospective analysis. So that will be meaningful and helpful. In many ways, I think the cat is out of the bag and the field is already moving forward. You know, in, in all of Europe, including the UK, uh, tier is now growing very quickly. Uh, with or without uh, reimbursement. And actually, I think the truth will come out of the other trials which are ongoing, look at inter looking at intermediate risk patients yeah. and those with perhaps less severe degrees of MR. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll learn the, res the lessons and interpret the results retrospectively in relation to the pivotal randomized trials. All right. Thank you. Um, Bob asks, um, in patients who have both severe MR and severe TR, okay, who are being considered for TR, um, what is your approach? Do you mitral clip and reassess them later to see if the TR gets better or do you clip them both? And I guess the reason part of why they asked, so they asked this question is because they see me doing both of these strategies. <laughs> so they maybe want an unbiased opinion. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe the answer is that the the fellows need to randomize you <laughs> no I think there's some very real world answers to this question so first is that sometimes uh doing both at one sitting takes a long time mm -hmm. depending on the anatomy and that becomes a very human thing in terms of the duration of the procedure the level of fatigue of the operator and the imaging specialist supporting them and also what else you have to do in the lab that day. And we, you know, we've often have scenarios where we set out to do both valves, but it just proves impossible because of just simple logistics. Yeah. There's also the issue about reimbursement. And if you only, um, if you do it in one procedure, you only get reimbursed once. Um, and if finance is an important part of your program, which it is because the devices aren't cheap, then you maybe need, just need to manage your, your uh, economics by separating the procedures. And again, it comes back to the patient. You know, if it's an elderly patient having a GA and the mitral goes very quickly and smoothly, and the tricuspid anatomy looks very suitable for a quick drive-by clip on the way out, then of course it's in the patient's interest to do it in one sitting. But my assessment and I'm not as expert as Azim, my assessment is that that perfect scenario is usually the exception rather than the norm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, last question, Dr. Terry asks, <clears throat> um, based on what you showed about LA, surgical LAA closure, um, do you foresee a future for um, LAA closure in patients um, before, after TAVR. And, you know, as you know, there's this watch TAVR trial by Samir Kapadia, which I think is pretty close to enrollment, where they've randomized patients to um, LAA closure plus TAVR versus TAVR alone if they have AFib. Any sort of um, predictions? I, I, think, I think that predicts the direction of travel. You know, often we take, you know, the surgical data and we extrapolate it into the transcaster field appropriately. And certainly the message from Laos 3 is very loud and clear. And surgeons were leaving Barcelona two weeks ago saying, right, I'm going to change my practice tomorrow. Right. Because for them, it's a very easy thing to do. Whether you staple it, whether you stitch it, or whether you excise it, it, it takes a surgeon five minutes. And they're in there anyway. Now, for us, it's not so simple because it's, a, it's a, an additional procedure and it's an additional device that costs money. So it's a different set of calculations. But I think the extrapolation from the surgical data is very clear. Great. 
Bernard, thank you so much. Thanks to the fellows as well for the great questions of the participants. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day, Bernard. See you in London soon. Great to okay. see you all. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.